that are con oh sorry uh, just to note this is being recorded um, we're joined by folks that have uh, all been participants in a new report uh, that looks at the impact of the facebook data for good program over the course of the um, incessantly crisis ridden year of 2020 um, it, it's been a really remarkable year i think for uh, you know not just the COVID pandemic, but for crisis response and for uh, the struggle to keep a number of uh, really important ongoing development humanitarian programs operational uh, in all areas of the world. And the community that's been um, working around Facebook Data for Good uh, that utilizes data sets from Facebook um, to help improve uh, their work, uh, it has been, I think, at the forefront of a lot of this work. Um, the report, uh, which was put out uh, earlier this week and which you can uh, get in the chat, um, uh, as a link, which is available on the website for Facebook Data for Good, um, outlines um, a selection of the key case studies uh, that have occurred ac across the year. It's, it's not actually a comprehensive list, um, but it, it's uh, some of the, I think, the most um, illustrative and important uh, work that's been done um, with this data um, in a variety of different contexts. Um, and we want to be able to focus this conversation uh, around not only um, sort of the good that was done, but also the challenges with um, how to be able to utilize large scale data sets like the ones that are being provided by Facebook, uh, which include mobility, uh, population density, includes uh, surveys around a set of key health um, and development problems uh, throughout the world, um, the challenges associated with how how do we actually make use of this operationally? Um, I think uh, I was one of the folks that, that did some of the research for this and helped to do the writing. Um, and I think one of the things that came up repeatedly uh, around this was, was that um, there's a lot of hope in being able to use, utilize data um, to our advantage in new ways in the future. Uh, but we have still a long way to go as a community to um, actually overcome some of the capacity constraints, um, some of the issues around methodology and interpretation um, and with translational networks that are able to really um, get these um, con the conclusions from data into the hands of decision makers in a timely and efficient way. Um, and this um, these sort of three things really inform the framework around Crisis Ready, um, which um, emerged out of the COVID-19 mobility data network to, um, you know, identify both data methodological and translational challenges associated uh, with how we utilize large scale private data sets for the public good. So with that in mind, um, the structure for this discussion is going to be um, two rounds of questions that are going to go to um, our panelists, which uh, include Laura McGorman um, from Facebook Data for Good, Dr. Alex Reinhardt, uh, Assistant Professor of Statistics and Data Science at Carnegie Mellon, uh, Aisha Durrani, who's the Communication and Development Specialist for UNICEF Pakistan, um, and Eustace Wambayani, who's a Program Specialist for CADASTA. Um, and um, so the first round will focus on uh, their projects that uh, all of which are featured in one way or another in the report um, and their sort of key understanding of the opportunities and challenges. And then the second round, we're going to focus in on implications for the COVID-19 vaccination effort globally, which is uh, arguably the most important um, health and development challenge of our times. Um, so, um, Without and we'll be followed up by uh, Jennifer Chan from Northwestern University, who's also part of the Crisis Ready collaboration, um, who will be pulling this together um, as a respondent. Um, and then we will turn things over to everyone else um, in terms of uh, discussion around these topics. Um, please utilize the uh, chat function to put questions in. Um, and we can also have people come off mute later on if, if uh, that works. Um, I want to also uh, note just as a quick housekeeping uh, business that uh, we will be putting a, a very short poll out towards the end of this session, um, which um, will will ask you to indicate um, uh, which organization you're representing and the sector that you're from so that we can understand the uh, community around uh, these discussions uh, better. So uh, we'll, uh, Mercedes will be putting that out um, at the appropriate time. All right. Um, 
that said, I'd like to hand things over to my colleague, Laura McGorman from Facebook Data for Good um, to kick things off. Thanks so much, Andrew, and thanks everyone for joining. It's really wonderful to have such a uh, diverse set of humanitarians, academics, and members of the public sector on the line. It's it's really heartening to, to read through uh, the list of names of people who are joining us. So thank you for, for joining on in uh, what is a very cold Friday morning where, where I am. Um, so my name is Laura McGorman. I lead a program called Data for Good at Facebook, and I'm hoping that the majority of participants on today's call are familiar with the program, but I'm going to give a very brief overview of what we do. Um, so Data for Good builds privacy preserving data products and the major goal here is in to empower our partners, largely nonprofits and academics, as well as members of the public sector, to make progress on social issues. Uh, I actually sit within Facebook's privacy and data policy team. So privacy by design is uh, the top priority of the work that we do. And hopefully some of what we can weave into the discussion today is not only how data made a difference from an operational perspective, but how we protected privacy of users around the world in doing so. Uh, we have three major pillars in the Data for Good program. We have a pillar called Maps for Good, which includes a lot of the work that we're doing using aggregated location data to better understand things like uh, adherence to stay at home orders, better understand things like the location uh, probability of co-location for groups that may be infected with coronavirus coming in contact with other people. Uh, we have another pillar called Surveys for Good, which uh, was really massively scaled this year. Alex from uh, CMU will talk about this, but we have a major effort underway to survey uh, people around the world on whether or not they're experiencing COVID-like symptoms, uh, and as of late, whether or not they would like a, a COVID vaccine if one were offered to them, as well as whether or not they've received one. And that survey has uh, achieved over 50 million responses in, around the world, which is quite staggering in its scale. And thirdly, we have an area called Insights for Impact, uh, which uses aggregated public post data from the Facebook platform to understand the public conversation around things like vaccines. And so we partner with groups like UNICEF, and Aisha will tell us more about that, to uh, better inform out online outreach using information from what is essentially the public conversation around vaccines. And this is to date focused on routine immunizations around the world, but we hope in 2021 to shift pretty, pretty dramatically to try to increase acceptance of the COVID-19 uh, vaccine. So I think the structure that we discussed that might be helpful is just to dive in uh, by explaining what I think worked really well in 2020 and then talking a bit about what we learned from the research uh, to perform the report told us we could have done better or, or things that we need to keep in mind going forward our areas for improvement. I think one major thing that uh, Andrew, Jennifer and the research team that contributed to this annual report found was that um, the scale of Data for Good, as Andrew mentioned at the beginning of the call, really exploded in 2020. So we started the year with about 100 partners we were working with around the world, and we're now at over 450 partners in nearly 70 countries. So pretty dramatic growth in the number of humanitarian organizations, universities, multilateral institutions, and even public sector partners who are leveraging some of our publicly available data sets. Just a dramatic scaling of who we're working with in real time to answer very pressing questions, largely around COVID-19 uh, containment. I think one of the backbones of, of that scale was the fact that we did not start the program in 2020 um, and that we had about three years under our belt working with people like Andrew and groups like NetHope, um, learning around what organizations actually need from groups like Facebook, and I would say perhaps even more importantly so, having a very, very strong culture of trust and open communication with our partners. Uh, throughout the annual report, you'll find that many of the organizations that had the biggest impact serving their public sector constituents were those that were already working uh, hand in hand with government agencies. So they weren't getting to know you while they were trying to be helpful. They already knew each other. There was already that culture of trust and that meant people could get right to work. Um, so in the case of Data for Good, I think we benefited from um, a legacy of working with humanitarians around the world that we were really able to uh, just jump right in at the start of the pandemic and get to work based on the relationships we had, the agreements we already had, and the way we had been operating uh, pretty sim seamlessly with our partners. So I think we're pretty proud of, of those successes. I think where we still have opportunity for improvement um, is continuing to put ourselves in the shoes of public health decision makers as our clients. So I think in the early days of Data for Good, we 
had a pretty broad definition of scoping tools for partners. And those partners could include academics, could include nonprofits, and, and we still wanna build for those communities. But what we find over and over again are tools that are intellectually interesting um, for research are quite distinct from tools that are operationally relevant for public health systems. And so increasingly, although we are um, very grateful and, and believe it's important that we continue to contribute to, uh, to cutting edge research, we also want to make sure that that research actually finds its way to people who are making decisions on the ground. And if it doesn't, we need to take a hard look at that and uh, ask ourselves if we're building the right things. So I think when we look towards 2021, uh, the major framework, and we can talk about this in the second round that I'm thinking through is um, really trying to be laser focused on the decisions that public health officials are making right now, depending on where they are in vaccination rollout and what the actual problems are. Um, you could argue that data right now might not be the most helpful tool in the toolbox when we have so many issues with supply. And so um, being really mindful and humble about the fact that in many cases, data is going to be a very, very small input to a larger public health system and really trying to be squarely focused on problems where we can make a difference. So right now that could be focusing on issues of vaccine hesitancy and not worrying so much about the operational rollout since that is more so related to supply. But I think we need to be really careful about focusing and making sure that our data is actually helping drive decisions rather than making assumptions that it that it will. So I'll pause there and, and I believe hand it back to Andrew uh, to introduce our next speaker. Thank you, Laura. Um, our next um, speaker will be Eustace Wambayani from Cadasta Foundation. Um, Eustace, um, please go ahead and introduce yourself and um, take it away. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Andrew. Um, I'm Justice Mumbai. Um, I'm program specialist uh, with Cadasta. I support Cadasta activity um, in East Africa. And I'll beg like that um, I switch off my video so that we don't have any challenges with bandwidth. I'm, I'm based um, down in Nairobi, in Kenya, in East Africa. Cadasta uh, Foundation. Um, is a nonprofit organization that works to empower individuals and communities by strengthening uh, land rights and putting users in control of their land rights related data. Um, we ensure that um, we are able to secure land rights uh, through mapping and documenting it. Um, we realize that um, and even uh, evidence um, and studies both from the UN uh, um, and other organization showing that um, 1 billion uh, poor people do not have secure land rights. Um, and this is usually mainly due to not them having control over the documentation of their land or the land not being documented. And even in cases where the land is documented, the land is documented and it's stored in paper format, which is stored in a room somewhere. What happens when we have a natural disaster such as an earthquake, forest fires, floods that are becoming common at the moment um, with the effects of climate change? Your guess is as is mine. So at Cadastra, we offer communities, government, and NGOs what we call an open and flexible suite of mobile and web-based tools designed to help them collect, manage, analyze, store and present land rights and resource uh, rights data. This information is used to do a number of things. Um, one is used to issue out uh, uh, land documentation. We have worked with governments and uh, through our platform, we have been able to document around uh, more than 100,000 um, parcels. So we have been able to issue out more than 100,000 land documents. Um, we have over 80 projects which are spread uh, across 33 countries in Africa, Asia, and South America. And in this particular case, uh, which brings us to speak today, um, it was um, early last year when COVID hit and there was announced a uh, lockdown across the country. Um, people are not going to work, children are not going to school. Uh, 
and at that, there also came an announcement from the government um, that it wanted to do some development and there were areas which had earmarked um, for demolition. Um, the areas were earmarked as 10. So when you hear 10 areas, it doesn't look like this big space. It doesn't look like it's gonna impact anyone. Uh, quickly uh, through uh, the network that work in here in Kenya, uh, our partner Pamoja Trust and the Housing Coalition decided to go in and gather evidence on what could have happened, on, on, on what will be the extent or, uh, of uh, this earmarked de uh, demolition. They came to us, the Cadastro Foundation, to offer them tools. Um, and using one of us to, uh, our, our tools, we're able to do a risk analysis and be able to measure, uh, like um, within a hundred, uh, if you're within a hundred meter radius, we say you're at a high risk. If you're out, we say you're at a low risk. Um, but we realize working with this data, but this, we're just only um, what we call here in Kenya, we're only using English to explain what is kind of a very great problem. Uh, what, um, so we wanted to put it in a numerical form. How could we do that? We had to show how many people are going to be affected by this. And that's when we, um, we thought about it. And we had heard about uh, Facebook data for good, uh, the population data. And we decided to overlay um, that information with the Facebook uh, uh, population uh, density data. And what was coming, uh, what we are getting from that is around 71,000 people were going to be evicted. And when you talk about 71,000 people, um, these are adults who have Facebook data, who have like maybe Facebook accounts and stuff. What happens, um, and um, so if, if there's 71,000 um, adults, we have very many children there, women are going to be affected. What we quickly did with our partner, we documented that especially, um, and then created uh, using story map, we were able to create a story and we were able to highlight how many people are going to, uh, to be affected and then we shared it with the community. And this is where the power of community comes in. When we were able to uh, share with the community, the community became empowered, they knew who would be affected and they started rallying at the local levels. They started rallying, um, going to the representatives and asking them to hold the eviction. We're happy to announce that um, due to that call, due to us mapping and due to us putting out the exact number of people who were going to be evicted, the eviction were halted. And until now, people continue to live peacefully in their homes. This is a very important case where data has helped us able to, in, to influence um, policy or influence, influence a government decision. And this is what is affecting um, most of the people that we are working with. They don't have data that they can use. But then again, where do they get the data? Uh, this kind of initiative by Facebook um, quite important. And, um, but in doing so, we also need to be aware of um, um, other rights that we need to protect, the rights to, uh, to privacy. How do we do that? I think that is the kind of conversation that we need to, to get ourselves into. And thank you so much, um, Andrew. Thank you, Justice. That's a, it's a fascinating case study and really important work. Um, and again, it's in the report that you can get through um, the link at Data for Good. Um, I'd like to next turn things over to Aisha Durrani, um, who's a communication uh, for development specialist at UNICEF Pakistan. There's a very different uh, use case around childhood vaccination. Aisha? Hey, everyone. Um, so in Pakistan last year, Due to the COVID outbreak, we found out that uh, people were really interested in information around child vaccination. Because of lockdowns and uh, other SOPs, they were not getting their children vaccinated on time. And um, so we were getting a lot of queries on the official social media platforms of the government uh, about where and when to get their children vaccinated. And then when the polio campaign started in the country in around July, 
the queries were uh, more around, can we get the same vaccinations, uh, the other vaccinations for routine schedule um, at our homes, which is not possible because these are injectables and we have to maintain them at a certain temperature. So uh, the pressure uh, came on most of the development partners and on the government to provide these services or actually to provide access to information to these services. So we were looking uh, for data insights on how to reach out to our target um, uh, communities and how to zoom into them and address their communication or information needs. And um, uh, last year, I think a lot of people started uh, relying on social media much more than they were actually relying on other uh, channels of communication. And uh, so the partnership with Facebook actually provided us with key insights on what was uh, the public's information uh, needs, um, what kind of, um, so we were targeting caregivers and uh, of children under the age of two. And for that, we had to find out what were uh, the specific information um, gaps which were uh, out there and which we had to fill out. So we had to connect them with the services. We also had to give them information on how to safely take their child for vaccination uh, while following the SOPs um, uh, during the COVID outbreak. So the data insights actually provided us key information on um, women as uh, the primary uh, caregivers, they tend to focus more on ch the child's health. And uh, for them, we had to target them rather than the fathers. The fathers are more interested in the political aspect of uh, vaccines. And then similarly, our, uh, most of the uh, adult population on Facebook is uh, over the age of 18. And so we had to, uh, and under the age of 35 years of age. So we had to tailor our content, which met the needs of young mothers and which also met the needs of our younger target audience. So it had to be more interactive, more engaging, uh, which meant that we had to develop uh, interactive games, quizzes, uh, crossword puzzles, and other um, illustrative posts, something that they could actually easily find information from and they wouldn't really have to read a long document to access it. And um, then uh, through the, and UNICEF actually provides support to the government to help manage their uh, official social media platforms, especially for the expanded program on immunization. And with that, uh, the partnership really helped us in uh, diverting the right target groups, in our case, which was youth and women, um, towards uh, the key messages that they were looking for. So um, it was really interesting to see that uh, they were interested in finding out more about vaccine efficacy, uh, whether vaccines were safe, um, how effective they were, how beneficial were they, they were. Um, so at the same time that they were asking for the vaccines, they were also concerned uh, whether it was safe to get their child vaccinated during the COVID outbreak. So all these um, questions, when it was answered through targeted, customized content um, based on the insights that we were getting through Facebook and also uh, through the sentiment analysis that we run of digital media in Pakistan through Keyhole Software, it it actually helps us. So a lot of data that comes in, um, we can zoom into our tar target audience. And it was um, in October last year that we had a dedicated digital media campaign uh, from the social media platforms of the expanded program on immunization. And the result was that we managed to achieve our target. We were able to reach out to 14.3 million um, people. And uh, we managed to increase um, the reach of the Facebook page for EPI um, up to 6 million uh, people. And um, overall, we were also able to engage 61% of female um, target population, uh, which is pretty high in Pakistan, because at the most, whenever we do run a sentiment analysis and we try to look at the statistics, we find out that women tend to participate, about 9 to 12% uh, of women tend to participate in public forums on social media. So it was a huge, huge um, uh, 
uh, win for us that we were able to engage this many um, young mothers into the conversation. And the younger, the youth that we were targeting, they are also uh, the ones who helped us in connecting with their families in ensuring that the information was getting to them. The only challenge that we had was that um, most of the conversation takes place in closed groups. So we don't always have um, access to that information. And then for us to tailor the content further, because we um, develop our digital communication strategies, we customize the content that needs to go out based on the insights that we have access to. But this is where we stop. So we can't access those closed groups. And some of the anti-vaccination sentiments actually originate from within these groups. So that is an area that we need to zoom into further and we need to uh, refine and see how we can actually um, address that. But all in all, the data really helped us in improving our coverage and reaching our target audience. Thank you. Thank you, Aisha, so much. And there's a lot to come back to uh, shortly when we talk about uh, the COVID vaccination in particular. I'd just like to remind everyone, if you have questions while we go along, please feel free to put them in the chat um, and we can come back uh, to address them a little bit later. Um, I'd like to just uh, now bring in Al uh, Dr. Alex Reinhardt um, from Carnegie Mellon University, um, who's been instrumental um, in a lot of the uh, data collection recently for um, Facebook. Alex? Thanks, Andrew. Yeah. So. I am a member of the Delphi group at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, Delphi has been around since about 2012, um, focusing primarily on what they would like to call epidem epidemic forecasting. Um, uh, often influenza, um, Delphi was influential in doing influenza forecasting every year um, for the CDC and other groups, um, got involved in several other campaigns and as you can imagine, last spring, the goals of Delphi shifted. Uh, and one of the problems we faced, I joined around this time as well, I wasn't involved before, but one of the problems we faced was data. As you may remember at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, um, testing data wasn't widely available. Testing access, it was difficult for people to get access to testing. Uh, states weren't uniformly reporting cases and tests and everything. Um, and so it was very difficult to know what was going on. And if you're interested in predicting where will the next COVID hotspot be, uh, what, where should people make policy changes, that's very challenging when you don't know what's going on. Uh, and so early on, uh, we thought, you know, one way of solving this problem would be to survey people and find out where people have COVID-like symptoms. But to do that, you need to be able to survey a lot of people across the country and do it every day uh, so that you can track if things change. Um, so we approached Facebook and surprisingly enough, Facebook said yes. Uh, so since early April, 2020, um, Delphi has distributed um, a survey with the United, within the United States um, with the help of Facebook that has reached um, 16 million responses as of a couple weeks ago. Um, and through that survey, we've been able to track COVID-like symptoms across the United States. We've been able to track social distancing behavior um, since September of last year, mask use uh, and mental health items, a whole suite of things related to, um, to the COVID pandemic. Um, and we've been working to distribute that data. At the same time, um, our colleagues at the University of Maryland uh, got involved soon after April last year uh, and developed an international version of the survey that's now distributed worldwide in I think 55 languages, 200 countries and territories around the world, um, also through Facebook. Um, and they've received tens of millions of survey responses as well. Uh, and together we've been able to track um, the pandemic around the world. We have found that for instance, Delphi collects a lot of data, not just the surveys, we have connections with healthcare partners, um, and you know, get public data on testing and so on. We found that this survey data is actually among the most reliable for correlating with confirmed cases. Um, and it, part, some of that data feeds into the forecasting work that we do. We also try to make the data available publicly in aggregate form uh, in an API so anyone can download it. Um, and on our website, anyone can download it, make maps, take a look and see what's there and try to inform decisions in their community. Um, we have a lot to think about 
coming into the for the future now, as we're going to get to in the second part of this, I think when we talk about um, the vaccination campaign and so on. So I will get to that because there's a lot going on. Um, but it has been remarkable to run this campaign that is now, to my knowledge, the largest survey, just I'm not putting qualifiers on that sentence, besides the census or a national census, it is the largest survey conducted for research uh, and have this be possible thanks to um, Facebook helping us recruit participants and giving resources to run this um, and the work of all of our teams here at, at CMU and a bunch of other institutions that have been helping out. All right, thank you, Alex. Um, and there's a lot to come back to here. Um, I think on the next round, um, uh, which we can, um, I think, go through in uh, with, with a few minutes per per participant, um, based upon you know what we've already heard from the types of geographies and use cases um, and points of view. Um, you know, where do you see um, the biggest opportunities and challenges uh, for the use of data sets from Facebook and in combination with other key data sets that are um, available now uh, to make uh, a significant impact on, on the COVID-19 vaccination effort worldwide. As we know, this has been um, extremely challenging um, in almost every country where it's taking place with a few exceptions. Um, uh, and uh, this is true uh, for a variety of different reasons, ranging from vaccine hesitancy, supply and demand uh, issues, uh, questions around um, understanding the availability of vaccines. Um, but, um, and, and this is going to, um, you know, be very different depending on which part of the world we're talking about. Um, so I'd like to come back to Justice uh, to start with. Um, from your point of view in Kenya, um, and, and given the work that you've been already discussing uh, with Cadasto, um, could, you, could you say a few words around where you think we are with um, data for the vaccination campaign? campaign. Um, um, in, in Kenya, um, there hasn't been much um, discussions around um, data on vaccination um, campaigns here. Uh, but um, there is a, there are a few things that we need to do um, when you're rolling out, um, let's say, a public campaign, which also vaccination is one of them. Um, how do we get to the communities here? Um, what data do we have that um, can help us, especially when we are rolling out these campaigns? What time is it good for us to go and, and vaccinate people? What time are we going to get people? For instance, how we do in land race, when you're going to do mapping, um, we have to um, understand the given community. At what time can we get the people? Maybe the, if, for instance, um, these are most of the communities that we deal with, especially in rural areas, Coastal communities, um, they move, uh, they're nomadic in nature. So we understand um, their movements, um, at what, what time are we going to get them um, in their homes or, and, and, and that we are able to, to roll um, uh, 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 the mapping exercise. Um, so um, that, um, from a special, uh, special point of view, I think um, that's um, what I can just um, maybe uh, um, uh, talk about. Is just to see how we're going to structure this. Uh, how we're going to um, how where are we going to get um, where are we going to get uh, the data or um, what are other anthropological issues that we need to to take care of in order to ensure that um, we're able to reach out to majority of the population. Excellent. Um, so, so kind of building on some of those themes, Laura, um, you know, where, where do you see Facebook uh, making kind of the biggest impact here, um, supporting uh, some of these various issues? Sure. Um, I mean, I think one thing that I've learned and one area where I think we probably won't focus because I'm learning over and over again that the data doesn't end up being used this way is issues of resource allocation. I think there's a lot of theoretical talk about building data sets that help allocate resources. But the fact of the matter is, if you don't have that many vaccines and you're targeting people over the age of 65, there's no Facebook data set, at least you know, in many of these countries right now doing a rollout, that's going to make that rollout better. These are sort of supply demand, supply chain problems. So I think we have an opportunity to be squarely focused where we think at every step in the value chain, our data can be helpful. I think 
to Aisha's uh, point, as well as the work that Alex and CMU are doing, as well as the University of Maryland, there's a lot we can do around vaccine hesitancy, as well as message testing. And so I think there's a huge opportunity for Insights for Impact to partner with organizations that really are trying to reach different audiences with different messages. But we also have to really figure out where that's the case. Um, something that we've learned is that there's not infinite flexibility in terms of the messages that public health officials are comfortable sending, um, that they want to send, because you know, when we're partnering directly with governments, there might be some set of things that uh, you know, are, are key to their outreach strategy. So it's partially about what data do we provide that make outreach about the vaccine more effective, but then also how do we specifically work with partners where that culture of testing messages, experimentation is part of their um, daily bread and butter, because we find that when we uh, partner with groups that are, we call it getting weird, willing to get weird and try something different with messages, that those are sometimes the most effective partnerships. And then how do we also then bring in additional voices from civil society um, to help tell the messages that maybe a government agency wouldn't send. So if there's going to be a slightly more reach everybody with uh, a few messages that uh, a state or a country is going to do about the vaccine rollout, how do we then have influencers and nonprofits tell additional stories? Um, one thing that we learned from uh, an outreach campaign around mask wearing is that just having people who you are respect and are essentially influencers wear a mask uh, on in a picture on social media created, a, I believe it was an eight percentage point increase in the number of people who reported uh, that they were going to wear a mask, which is a dramatic increase um, in these sorts of public health sentiment uh, perspectives. So I think trying to be purposeful where our data can actually make a difference. And I think a lot of it's gonna be around messaging and getting content correct. And then also being purposeful about finding the right partners where our data can actually be leveraged to scale um, in communities that are you know, open-minded about experimentation and innovation. Thank you. Absolutely. And, and to your point about vaccine hesitancy, I mean, uh, this seems like something that's already come up um, in Aisha's discussions around childhood vaccination, not COVID actually, bro more broadly in, in uh, Pakistan. Um, Aisha, how, how are you guys um, thinking of addressing this um, going forward this year? Okay, um, so even last year, um, we were able to use the data insights to uh, proactively do uh, counter messaging. So we developed content, uh, you kind of forecast uh, the public information needs. And similarly, that's what we are doing for COVID. We are trying to find out what is what kind of information the public is looking for, what kind of misinformation is making its round. So then we develop content messages based on that. Um, we develop content to answer all their needs. We get um, scientists, we get experts to answer their queries. And this is actually helping out. It addresses misinformation. It keeps the uh, overall public sentiment either neutral or positive. And then it also helps us. Uh, so sometimes when misinformation starts in one area, if you're providing such positive information, it's the public who takes up the cause and posts positive content. So you don't even have to come in. It's the public answering on your behalf. So that's what we are looking at. We do need such forecasting for COVID-19. We need to know uh, what kind of conversation is taking place. Um, what's the negativity around certain issues? Because there are a lot of vaccines that are being introduced. And then the public is also um, really hungry for the vaccine right now. They are more interested in that. And even now that we are moving into um, uh, this year with uh, typhoid uh, campaign, typhoid vaccine campaign, we know that people will actually ask us for a COVID vaccine. So this is the, these are the kind of insights that we need. And they will actually help us in designing our strategies and ensuring that we meet their information needs. All right. Um, well, a lot to take on, on there. Um, so, Alex, how are you going to help her uh, meet these um, <laughs> meet these needs? Where it, it seems like uh, this is where a lot of these questions around survey data uh, and some of these other. Um, uh, I know that uh, Carnegie Mellon is dealing in the United States, uh, not internationally. Although there's a version through University of Maryland. Um, could you speak to some of um, you know the issues that you had initially started to bring up, and then uh, also responses to to the kinds of points that were just made? Yeah. So. This is definitely an important topic of 
are people willing to get vaccinated? If they're not willing to get vaccinated, why not? What are the reasons? Uh, the hope is if you if we could understand all those reasons, maybe it's practical and logistical problems they have. Maybe it's they don't believe the vaccine is effective. If we could understand those reasons, maybe we could uh, officials and other groups could develop messaging campaigns, could do outreach, whatever is necessary to get the vaccine to people who need it. Um, and so we've been working recently on a vaccine module to add um, to both the US and international surveys, slightly different versions of it um, that'll try to address this. And so far we've added questions about vaccine uptake. So have you had it? As well as for those who haven't had it, if it were offered to you right now, would you get it? Um, and we're developing additional questions about, well, if not, why not? What are lists and possible reasons? Um, this is proving to be quite difficult, especially to track uptake, uh, since everyone's so confused about how they can get the vaccine, when it'll be available, who's prioritized. Trying to ask people, well, are you in a priority group? So we can track, for instance, whether each priority group is receiving the vaccine. Well, they may not know because it's so confusing and everyone's doing different rules. Uh, so it's very hard to write survey questions about this. Um, but I think the, the hope is, we can develop a set of questions that address these needs and hesitancy um, and start collecting that data. And for instance, there's a pressing question I see in the chat that I might jump to right now, which is vaccine hesitancy among women. Um, we don't yet have data to address this directly, but one thing we've heard a lot from survey respondents informally is that pregnant women are very concerned that um, they don't know if the vaccine is safe for them. This is actually probably the most common type of email I've received from survey respondents recently. Um, and that's something we need to address, we need to find out if, how common of a concern, concern that is so that health officials um, could figure out what to do about it. Researchers could potentially do the necessary research to evaluate safety and e efficacy uh, for pregnant women and so on. So there's quite a lot of work to do in the next couple of months to try to, to, to build out these questions and then get the data in the hands of people who could use it. Um, great. Um, I, I would like to give um, Jennifer Chan, um, who I see now back, uh, the ability to uh, sort of think across a lot of what you've heard so far. I mean, uh, and, and, you know, both questions around, you know, operational programs and the vaccination campaign, you know, uh, you know, where, um, you know, what, what sort of ties together some of what actually makes some of these impactful? Uh, where do we see some of the kind of persistent threads come up around uh, capacity requirements, um, translational issues, um, and then particularly Particularly in the case of the vaccine, um, you know, issues around both data collection and and also uh, privacy, equity, and, and and other kinds of key issues. Um, so not not to make the field too big for you, but but uh, um, what do you what help us to pull some of this together? Sure, Andrew. So thanks everybody for joining, and I'll try to do my best to capture some of these uh, patterns. I think to start out with, you know, going all the way back to to. Laura's comments in the very beginning of the session. I think all of these examples and reflections that everybody's sharing really is just a remarkable, just snapshot of the diversity of what Facebook's data products can do. I mean, everything from high resolution population density that's hosted on HDX by the Center for Humanitarian Data that's free. I think there's a great example of how you can really core that down to the work that is meaningful for Cadasta and communities. And you look at the arc of what a data set that could be so largely used by another agency, but really just focused laser sharp on you know, what is meaningful for families and documenting their land rights to be able to advocate at even a local level for policy that has implications, um, even that are durable to this day. And then thinking about Aisha's comments about how you know, there's interactive tools that are syncing up with other technology-based tools to meet um, some of the goals um, for the EPI program. Um, is another example of that diversity. As you look across this ecosystem of data and use, that's another great example of how it can be, how it can be used. And you know, the examples that she was giving in the second section of the discussion is just forward thinking about how do you address some of these context specific, not necessarily sector new issues around misinformation, but really trying to anchor it down into the next 2021 20, year and beyond. 
And so those are some things that I think are really remarkable about how diverse the state is. And then also all of the comments by Alex with regard to the role of researchers who can actually partner, um, also watch um, the other ways that different organizations are trying to tackle problems, just like Andrew is asking Alex to sort of comment on EIC's challenges, um, really sort of is a remarkable way that the data is diverse. Um, and actually, interestingly, inclusive if we talk about all the different types of examples here so that people can really dig into the methods, address some of the biases that I know people are asking in the chat group, um, but really is trying to do the best that they can as researchers um, to target uh, the implications of programs, whether it be at a local level, a national level, or even at a global level. And I think that in the end, um, some of those are great examples of the you know, of sort of the, the potential impact that we're seeing, but it all kind of looks a bit different. Um, and I would say, as we go into discussion about I'll recap sort of the second and sort of focus a bit more on vaccinations is to talk a little bit more about some of the challenges that you all have faced or for folks in this, um, our whole group today to maybe sort of pose some challenges that relate to capacity, that relate to translational readiness, being how do I know what to do next with that data? What does it look like? It looks different to me than it does to you. Um, really, what are we going to do with it? Um, so I urge you to sort of um, share those questions, um, share those experiences, because uh, we have a nice opportunity um, to, to talk about those a little bit more today. In the vaccination discussion that we just had in the second session, again, I think what speaks to me, um, and I'm um, open to hearing what everybody else thinks, is it's context-driven. Even though we all say it's COVID-19, and even though we all say vaccination, just this had a really great comment, I thought. It has to be very practical. Um, it has to, again, talk about anthropological issues. And I think there's ripe opportunity for many organizations at all different levels to be able to ask those questions and align the data to those specific important, you know, implications for operational planning. But at the same time, you know, vaccine hesitancy, like Aisha talked about, is really about how do you dynamically use your tools and systems um, to be able to continue as you learn more about what people are worried about or what communities feel one way or the other, you have to adapt. And maybe there's roles for um, researchers um, like Alex and his colleagues to be able to develop those new techniques. And I'm sure again, there through these adaptations, um, I would love to hear more from all of you on the panel and folks in this, um, on this whole session about what you envision these challenges to be in 2021. Um, Cause I would, I would anticipate that um, we might have some similar ones. Um, I would also encourage folks here in this room, if some of those challenges sound like the ones you've heard five, 10 years ago, um, share those as well. Um, Cause I think there are a lot of great lessons that we can um, sort of share during this time together. And some of the um, additional things that I've been seeing up until recently in the chat is about privacy and bias. And so I think there's also right discussion to talk about that. Um, and also I would, I would encourage us to talk about privacy at a very practical level. Um, if there's any good lessons learned about how people have dealt with the day-to-day -day questions around what to do with privacy, even as you receive a privacy um, or like a, a data set that has been um, looked over, aggregated, um, to think about what some of the responsible data practices uh, might still be um, in the work that we do. Yeah, I think all of that is incredibly important. Um, we, and I, I'd like to just pick up one thing uh, that you were flagging as well a couple times around around bias um, in data sets. Since we're talking about um, you know very large uh, surveys, we're talking about highly diverse data geographically in terms of respondents, in terms of issues. Um, we have a question from J.M. Bauer from WFP. I don't know, uh, would you like to come off mute and ask your question, um, join the conversation on here, or I can ask it on your behalf? Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. Hi, Andrew. Hi. Uh, appreciate you getting us together. Um, I suppose wh where, I'm, where I come from uh, is an environment where we've got uh, limited connectivity. Um, access to technology is an issue. I used to be WFP's country director in Congo, and not everyone has a mobile phone. Not everyone has a Facebook account. And when I um, look at survey data, it's always really um, important to consider bias. Uh, who's in your data set? Who's not? Um, so I was really hoping to hear uh, from you all, how do you de-bias, how do you validate some of the data 
uh, that you've shared, uh, both uh, for the maps and the, and the surveys you've talked about. Thanks for getting us together. Um, I don't know who would like to take that one. Suppose I can start. Um, be happy to start with a brief discussion. So, with our surveys, for instance, um, that's a very important question. You know, if we see symptoms increase, well, which population exactly are we measuring that in? Is that is that a biased population? If we see that a certain percent of people will say that they wear masks in public, do they really? And is that a bias? Like, does that represent the behavior of the public in general? Uh, and it's quite difficult to to measure whether you're doing the right thing, because there, for a lot of this data, there is no other sort of gold standard source that you can go to and compare against. So, for instance, we can compare symptoms to confirmed cases, uh, and the correlation is great. But confirmed case data, I mean, how, do, how does that match actual infections? How could we tell um, if the testing access varies? You see big jumps when states correct data or go through backlogs and things. Um, we've seen a few things. Um, so we've, like in the United States, we've done a lot of comparisons of the demographics of the survey respondents versus the population in general based on their answers to the survey. And we've seen the demographics actually there's not a huge age skew. There's not the type, types of skews you'd be worried about, at least in the United States data, since everyone has a phone in the US. Well, not everyone, but it's such a large chunk of the population. Um, we, so we've, we've looked at things like that. Um, we have seen certain effects. For instance, uh, our mask wearing data, there is groups, for instance, Resolve to Save Lives recently put out an analysis where they compared our mask data to which is self-reported, do you wear a mask in public, to the data in a couple of locations where officials are using surveillance camera footage to see are people in public places actually wearing masks. And it turns out that people, either our survey is biased towards people who tend to wear masks more, or people tend to be a little optimistic about what proportion of the time they wear masks in public. Uh, and so they were finding lower numbers in the actual surveillance camera footage. Uh, but this is definitely a, a difficult problem and one that we have to be mindful of as we do anything with this data that we, we don't know um, exactly how biased it is. Um, and so whenever we do report a result, we need to be careful to report like the demographics and other things that we've seen, not just claim, oh, we found that 50% of people in this area say this thing. I think on the Facebook side, I'm happy to address this. Um, this is one of the first questions that comes up in any discussion in Data for Good, and it's something we've thought a lot about since the onset of our program. Um, so a couple of years ago, we took a look at um, our high resolution population density maps, which are built with satellite imagery and census data. So the gold standard on where people actually live. And then the baseline location data of Facebook, well, Facebook location history users, because we actually, um, at least in mobility data products, are not seeing all Facebook users. It's a subset of people who opt in to share their location information. So it's actually like a sample of a sample of a sample. Comma, <laughs> do you know anything about the law of large number, law of large numbers? Even if you're looking at 15% of the Facebook population in the country, we're still talking often about millions and millions of people. In Congo, uh, fewer by a lot. But so what you find is that the goodness of fit when you compare the gold standard population data to the Facebook location uh, population, so to speak, is that you have really high fit in many places in the world, lots of places that I wouldn't have expected. I thought it was just gonna map to region, like really good in North America, really good in Europe. Actually really, really good in many parts of APAC. India, Indonesia have huge Facebook penetration. Um, and again, law of large numbers, we have such a big sample that you're not getting huge skews. Um, and then also even in Sub-Saharan Africa, when you're talking about urban centers, you actually also have pretty good fit. Now, when you're talking about rural Africa, not so much. Um, and that's where I have to say, you know, we're really fortunate that we work with very responsible, uh, well-informed partners around the world. And so very rarely will someone just, you know, pull a Facebook data set into a model and there's no uh, triangulation of any kind. I mean, the first step in any model that any of our partners create is incorporating other traditional data sources from administrative data sets to say, okay, this is what the Facebook data is telling us. Now it's alongside census information. What's the delta? So I think there's a combination of sort of Facebook driven research that we can do to sort of 
address issues of bias and, and inform our partners about them. And then there's obviously work that our partners are going to do to combine Facebook information with other sources to make sure that where bias does exist, we're calling it out. So that's on the on the data side. I think um, yeah, on I the oh sorry oh used to skip. Andrew. And yeah, go ahead. I, I go was ahead. wanted to raise that as, as one of the users of data. And um, and this one thing uh, at Cadastro Foundation, we understand that um, we have challenges in other areas when it comes to um, access to mobile devices or access to the internet and everything. And we might also, which also results into some data gaps. And we try to solve this um, using, um, by providing a um, number of sorts of tools. And we also um, understand that um, there is an element of fit for purpose, fit, fit for use. This data that you might need for advocacy purposes, but there's some data that you need maybe for securing of tenure, for issuing of title deeds. Those two kinds of data need a different kind of accuracy. If you need like household-based or data, we have tools that can do that. We can go and collect uh, using a mobile phone around 150 USD. We, we can be able to collect data um, accurate enough data that you can use um, to collect all the information about a household plus their location where they are on, on, on a point or on the subject of the earth. Thanks. Yeah, no, I think this, the, 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 the point around, around multiple data sources and being able to identify, you know, where you can answer certain questions based upon survey data and where you actually have to go out and collect new is, I think, an important consideration as you triangulate, um, you know, the, the data pipelines and the data collection um, around uh, the specific research questions at hand. I want, I want to maybe quickly call on Dr. Uh, Carolyn Bucky, who's with us, um, who can maybe talk a little bit from the methodological side as to how, how we also deal with this. Yeah, um, I think um, most of the points have been made to some extent. I think bias in these data sets is something that we still haven't come to terms with in methodologically, how we adjust. And this triangulation point is important. Um, potentially not only, I mean, census data is often wildly out of date in many countries, so census data is also not very useful. Um, but the issue of triangulation is really important, and I think multiple data sets from, you know, CDRs, comparing that, doing this careful work to look at these new data streams and try and understand who's missing is actually, a, it's a huge research topic that has to be undertaken in the next few years. We've done some work where you look at, you know, you can use behavioral proxies for different income levels and things to, to try and adjust. Um, but there's, there's, it's quite, um, at the moment, it's very hard to validate. And I just want to um, echo what Justice was saying is that I think that um, what, what's really promising is marrying these big data high tech solutions with what we already know about on the ground data collection. So you know, we've done work in Bangladesh where you're looking, you're looking at detailed travel surveys, household studies, and then we have people that go around and, and say where the, you know, where, where the households actually are and map them. We have a kind of a crowdsourced approach that's very um, on the ground. And when you marry that, those two approaches, I think you have a powerful way to try to understand the bias and quantify it. And I think that the effort to quantify bias is going to be um, is going to be challenging to make it into a um, sort of easy to publish academic work, but it's absolutely essential if we want any of this to be useful for on the ground practitioners. Um, so I, I think that you know it, it's really important, and it's something that we haven't really figured out how to do yet. And that's true not just for this kind of data, but for other kinds of data, like in my world, um, pathogen genomics and molecular surveillance, right? How do we take COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2 genomes and combine that with mobility data in a way that's meaningful? There's so much work to be done methodologically, and I think we're really at the early stages. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think, let me just go to the queue um, to, Jen, did you want to reply to um, what Carolyn and, and others were talking about here? Sure, just briefly. You know, I want to echo Justice's comments again. I think one of the ways to frame some of the question around biases is framing it just like Carolyn said around the methodologies and the quantitative and the iterative aspect of, of moving forward into the future. I would also suggest that we look at bias as a people-driven phenomenon. 
So one of the things that we were able to sort of begin to learn about in the user feedback project with um, Crisis Ready that was supported by Northwestern was learning that actually once people were looking at the mobility data during COVID at the New York De City Department of Public Health, people were feeling and understanding that there was something biased about the data, but it was the conversations that public health providers had with researchers back and forth and back and forth, change the data, looking at the pipeline, having more conversations about the context that people felt were biased. So that's not necessarily going to be the penultimate answer to bias in a dichotomous sort of role. But I think it's a really interesting way to think about people before data and the fact that translational readiness of data and these new types of ways that we use it is about data. But as we move closer to information and meeting and ultimately decision making, the qualitative behavioral conversational components about bias might actually be really uh, an important component to, to really integrate into the way that we do things. Thank you. Um, Aisha, you had noted that you wanted to jump in here. Yes, just one point. Um, of course, I won't go into the, that into detail about the data bias, but for us, it was more about misinformation because for that, um, a lot of the work that good work that is actually happening in the country goes sideways when there's a lot of misinformation, right? So data, sites, uh, data insights can actually help you with that. Um, I totally understand uh, your point about um, the availability of uh, networks, uh, data networks in um, different areas, but the Facebook penetration in Pakistan is also pretty good. And uh, the other thing is that a lot of the key influencers are actually the ones uh, who post their comments or um, give their opinions on social media and then it goes viral, then it's everywhere, then it forms public opinion. So um, we need to address it, nip it in the bud where it is. So it's how you use data sets. Um, there are different uses for it. Yes, there are certain areas where we need to research more, we need to fine tune it further, but there are other areas where you can use it as it is. And of course, you don't just rely on Facebook data, you also rely on the social and behavioral data that you're getting from the field uh, through face-to-face -face interaction with the public. So there are different sources of data sets that you use to uh, basically base your strategy on. Thanks. I'd like to uh, sort of building off all these points, um, I'm hoping we could bring in Samita Singh. Uh, and I think Alex kind of addressed you a little bit of your question from, from Gavi er, earlier um, around women um, and the COVID vaccine. Um, but I'm wondering, uh, you know, if, if based on some of this conversation around bias, around multiple data sources, um, around field data versus uh, kind of large scale sensor data, um, you know, whether uh, you'd like to maybe, um, you know, Kind of deep in the where you're going with some of this, or or or, or ask the question um, that you were asking earlier about about the the about women and, and COVID vac vaccine hesitancy. Sure, thanks, Andrew. Uh, so this is you know something which we uh, we were talking earlier in the day with um, some of the WHO and the CDC colleagues. Uh, we were looking at uh, multiple. Um, global surveys which have uh, been done and uh, we we were looking that there is a uh, you know a consistent trend across independent surveys and research which is uh, sort of indicating a very high vaccine hesitancy with respect to the covid-19 vaccine among women much more higher than men and uh, so while we have the data we were struggling to understand that, you know, what are uh, the possible reasons, what are the triggers, uh, and from a very, uh, uh, you know, uh, behavior lens. And uh, that is what the question, so I, I got this invite uh, uh, to join this call and I just grabbed it and I was like really hoping that I would get the opportunity to ask this question if you have like some some sort of insight around this uh, based on whatever work you're doing, I really would be very excited to hear if you have something. Over, thank you. Thank you. Over to you all. So this is, this is interesting to me. So we actually are just beginning to do demographic breakdowns of 
this vaccine survey data um, that we've collected so far. Um, and we have seen, I won't offhand know the numbers for vaccine acceptance or hesitancy, but I do know for uptake, that is what proportion of people have been vaccinated. For instance, if you look at healthcare workers who are top priority group, uh, a larger percentage of men who are healthcare workers have been vaccinated than women who are healthcare workers. Uh, so there is that gap there. We also see um, in the data a pretty big disparity, uh, racial disparity uh, in vaccine acceptance uh, or hesitancy. Uh, so Black and African American people are much more likely to be skeptical of the vaccine, not willing to take it, be worried about potential side effects from the vaccine. Uh, and what we're planning to do now is to prepare a set of aggregate data files uh, that are broken down by different demographics so we can release these publicly. And so that people like you who have specific questions about the data want to know, is this group more or less likely um, to be hesitant or who have been vaccinated? Um, so that you could download that data and take a look for yourself because what we're finding is there's so many questions and interesting things in this data, we just can't answer every question ourselves, uh, which is why we've developed the process to share the data as much as we can with researchers. Yeah, I mean, I I think at this point, it's a little bit early to give um, a very informed answer, but I think, and Aisha, I'd love your perspective on this too. Some of what we found across the Insights for Impact partnerships is that there is this prevailing cross-country trend where women tend to be more focused on the personal and family effects of, of vaccines. So things like side effect and safety. Um, and then men are much more focused on the sort of systemic aspects of, of getting the vaccine. So is the government doing a good job with rollout? Um, is it sort of annoying to have to go to the health center and wait in line kind of thing? And so I could imagine there could be um, a pretty similar set of gender splits in terms of um, vaccine hesitancy, whereas, uh, women are often around the world are kind of the primary caregivers of children and thinking through the lens of, is this safe for me? Is this safe for my family? And absolutely, I would, I'd have to echo Alex's point about the fact that there's simply no data on the efficacy in pregnant women. I think it's very concerning for women who are pregnant, women who want to be pregnant, women who are lactating. I mean, um, I have a number of both pregnant and uh, uh, breastfeeding moms in my friend group, and it's a constant source of information and even healthcare providers can't tell people definitively that it's safe because they weren't included in the original clinical trial. So I think that there are also questions that public health systems need to address first before we expect people to get comfortable. <laughs> I mean, similarly, I'm assuming there's some significant spatial variation to this question around um, uh, the kind of variance between uh, women and men and, and uh, vaccine hesitancy. I mean, I, Aisha, maybe you can speak a little bit to that from, from your point of view in Pakistan. How, how have you seen some of these issues uh, play out and, um, you know, also think through maybe some of these data questions around what would be, what would be helpful here? Okay. In Pakistan, we haven't actually uh, seen this. So I was surprised to uh, hear this um, comment. And I would actually like to know what was the data source through which you found out? And then which geographic location uh, did you get that information from? Because it can't be consistent across the globe. It might be within pockets uh, in different geographies. Like in Pakistan, maybe um, we might have this problem in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa or Balochistan in case uh, because they don't have access to information. It's the men who usually have the mobile devices who have access to radio, TV, and other channels of communication. So it's a matter of how well have they been educated or informed about it. Um, so we haven't really seen anything around that right now everyone uh, so far from the looks of it they are eager to get vaccinated. Uh, we haven't really seen that uh, hesitancy just uh, based on gender. So I guess we really need to go in depth and look at that. Uh, because in Pakistan, even for child vaccination, uh, it's not necessarily women who refuse, it's men. 
Um, sometimes in certain cases, it's women, but otherwise it's men who don't feel comfortable enough vaccinating their children. And they tell the women folk, don't get them vaccinated when the teams come, outreach teams come to your house or come near you. So it depends from area to area. And you, you cannot even pigeonhole it to a certain uh, location or a certain province, because sometimes we have a very conservative uh, society in Sindh, Karachi. And we might have someone more liberal in KP. So it depends on people. It depends on ethnicities. It depends on a lot of variables. Um, and you need to look into that before. Um, but it's an interesting um, point. Absolutely, Aisha. And uh, thanks for this. And um, uh, of course, Pakistan wasn't one of the countries I was talking about. So I definitely. Um, uh, thing that uh, you might not be seeing it. But uh, there are quite a few countries in the global south and of course in the other uh, parts where we are seeing this trend and we're trying to put together a number of uh, surveys which have been done either by some of the Gavi core partners or um, market research agencies. And uh, well, we, we've just kind of started looking at it very closely. So perhaps uh, in some time we would be able to share what we think about it. And I would love to do that, to pick your brains on it. But um, yeah, for now, I really do not have much, uh, much intelligence around it. Yeah, but thank you so much. Thank you. Over. Thank, but thank do you, look Sarita. into the misinformation, sorry do look at the misinformation within those areas because sometimes that might be the root cause um, and it might be going around and you might find out that that was the reason for this myth uh, growing out of proportion, why they don't want to get vaccinated. That's what we found out in Pakistan. And, and I just to echo, I mean, I think that, that um, you know, trying to flag gender disaggregation on, on understanding vaccine, vaccination willingness, vaccination rates, vaccine access. I mean, I think this has to be sort of a key area for both operations and for the research agenda. So, so I think, you know, I, uh, everyone's comments have drawn attention to, to the need to place gender disaggregation at the center of how we're kind of thinking these things through, which is, a, I think, a very important point. Um, I'd like to maybe pivot just really quick to um, Amy Kofenauer from Cadasta, who was asking, and this is a question around capacity building that's come up uh, quite a few times um, in, in different respects around, um, you know, what is required to actually, um, you know, process, utilize, um, you know, uh, interpret, manage uh, the data sources that are available. Um, Amy, I, I'm wondering if you wanted to um, come in and, and ask that question, um, and then we can think about these capacity issues um, in relationship to, I think, a number of the other issues that have come up so far. Sure. Thanks, Andrew. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, you know, so I asked, to, uh, and I want to give kudos Justice, who did a great job talking about, about this, this joint project. It's been a great collaboration. Um, we, you know, we have a, we're a global platform. We have over 5 million people's rights documented on the platform. That includes geospatial and household level information, community information. And you know, from, a, from a data science and research perspective, you know, as, a, as, as a fairly small NGO, it's, it, you know, we don't have a data scientist or a researcher on our team to say, hey, let's really dig into this data and, and learn how to understand it. What can we get out of it? Um, you know, there are all kinds of data around type of land documentation, uh, gender at disaggregation, age. Uh, we also have tons of data on perception of tenure security. So interviewing people, how likely do you think it is that you might lose your land in the next five years and why? Um, these are really important data points and you are sitting on this and we, we have a very clear privacy policy at Cadasta um, and we're very clear with our partners. They own the data, we do not, um, but they do share disaggregated data with us and also uh, often will share data when there's a research question or issue that we want to dig into. Uh, so, but you know, this is a capacity issue and I think but if you, we're also really interested and we have been for a long time on crowdsourcing data. How do you 
how do you look at the kind of accurate household level and geospatial data that we collect around land and property rights and, and combine it with other data sets around things like conflict or this you know, tenure insecurity based on resource, uh, resource challenges, things like land grabs, risk of evictions, and all of those kind of things. And how do we then how did we then layer that data in a way that's meaningful for like predictive analysis around where we might see uh, issues or where there's a government policy that has opened up opportunities for people to secure their land and, and, uh, and, and do systematic formalization of, of tenure. So we have so much opportunity to take these data sets, but very, but like zero capacity internally to do it. And I'm just, that's what really where my question was coming from. So thoughts about where, where organizations like ours and some many of the people who are on this call right now, how do we access that? Where, you know, what is the role that data for good can play and all of that? So thank you very much. Thank you. No, I, th I think this is a, a problem that a lot of us, um, uh, particularly in the NGO community struggle with. Um, you know, I know this was, uh, Jen, this was kind of at the heart of a lot of what you've found in, in some of your research, um, both in, in the NGO community and um, in the public sector, um, you know, around data teams, around uh, data literacy, around uh, data pipelines. This is one of the things that's been one of the, um, you know, kind of animating um, impulses of Crisis Ready to, you know, what can we do um, through the nonprofit and research communities to help build data data pipelines, data methods, and translational networks that can ease the burden of that capacity. But I want to ask, um, you know, others, maybe start with you, Jen, around, um, you know, what, what do you think we can, we can do here and, and where are the kind of key uh, pinch points? Sure, I would say um, I'll organize it in one way. You know, from the capacity building, and, I, and one of the things I heard you mention, um, Amy is about, you know, the data is with your partners or with the, you know, the communities. And there's some um, long view investments that can be made to building capacity of communities at the community level. And one resource and individual that I would refer you to in her great work is Heather Leeson for the International Federation of the Red Cross. She's got a lot of online sort of um, points of access for being able to think about practical program project driven ways of being able to use smaller data sets or even larger data sets but target them kind of in the way that we've talked about it. You know, there are some organizational capacity buildings that I, we've seen through the NetHope user um, feedback uh, project, which is you know part of what brought me here as an advisor for NetHope and part of that project is there are some of our smaller and medium sized NGOs and NetHope's consortium of 50 plus NGOs that are using um, support organizations or third party organizations who can help them with that scaffolding of being able to bring in um, population density data from HDX, but be able to sort of customize it and support and serve it out. Um, a lot of in water and sanitation programs uh, with water aid um, as an example, and, and we'll be sharing a report next week. So that would be the second way to look at seeking out organizations that can serve up more of the technology platforms, but customize it for the, the uses that you really have a high priority for. And then as Andrew referenced, you know, some of the uh, capacity building, uh, as it leans a bit more towards the translational readiness, how do we really dig into these methods? What do we do with these new data sets is, is an example of Crisis Ready's um, COVID-19 mobility data network, where you have teams all over the world tackling individual problems across multiple continents, but very in targeted local office targeted ways. Um, so that's a, a more of a sector wide type of approach to capacity building. Um, and then the last one I will note is what I've seen over the years advising is I think what's a really encouraging phenomenon of people in leadership positions asking very similar questions. Um, and I think there's a, uh, there's a good opportunity for data literacy at almost a C-suite level, because there's so many things that need to be tackled for increasingly important reasons, but being able to help people at that level understand how to prioritize what internal organizational investments might need to be made in order to get there, um, both at um, a hiring level um, to a partnership level to a donor level um, is something that I think is also an important part of the conversation about capacity with these types of data sets. 
Absolutely. I mean, not, not to put Laura on the spot, but how do you think about this from the Facebook point of view? I mean, I, I think this is something that came up in a lot of the research questions, actually, is that there's a huge variance amongst organizations um, in terms of everything that Jen was just describing. I mean, you're trying to understand, you know, how to make impact through a data publication platform and um, bearing in mind those variations. I mean, is there anything that, that comes up on the Facebook side around capacity and how you factor that into your strategy? Sure. Um, so I'll start with the things that I think everyone's doing well. So when we were doing the research for the annual report, I think a common thread among the successful examples of use of Facebook data over the last half is that a lot of the questions that people wanted to answer were quite similar. <laughs> so to go, I'm sorry, quite similar, but also quite simple in the sense that um, if we go back to the Cadasta example, the fundamental question you all were trying to answer in Kenya was where do people live? And do they live close to where construction is going to occur? And if they live really close to where construction is going to occur, does that mean that they're at high risk of eviction? Um, that's a pretty straightforward operational question. Where are the people? Where is the construction? What's the likelihood of eviction as a result of those two things? And so, you know, we can talk a lot about really advanced predictive AI, but sometimes the questions we need to answer on the ground are as straightforward as where are people living? right now and are they in danger? Um, and so I think not um, discounting the importance of answering some of these foundational straightforward questions on population density, um, I think is an important thing. We can get ahead of ourselves sometimes and I wanna give you all credit for sometimes focusing on, on pretty straightforward and fundamental questions rather than jumping forward um, to things that maybe sound sexier but aren't as um, impactful. So I think keeping it simple sometimes is, is a benefit, not only from a capacity perspective, but from an impact perspective. And then sure, um, in 2021, we're Facebook, my team is a data team, but we have a number of teams that are exclusively focused on partnerships with NGOs around the world. And so we're, we're gonna be working closely with a group called Global Impact Partnerships this year um, on a set of trainings. Specifically, we wanna work uh, with some government agencies and ministries of health to use our high resolution population density maps for vaccine distribution. We're gonna be targeting a handful of countries um, doing sort of multiple days of training on essentially how to use geo information, um, GIS tools um, to, to do actual vaccination planning and outreach. And then I think really trying to hear from you all what would be helpful. Um, you know, we have partners that have done things that, you know, look like trying to cover something like Excel and R in a one hour online training. And, um, you know, we sometimes try to bite off more than we can chew from a, from a capacity building perspective. And so trying to make sure that we, we deliver training in a way that's impactful and actually makes a difference for our partners is something we were very focused on this year. Thanks, Laura. Um, I don't know if I can bring Carolyn back in or, or such it, but I mean, this is something that we've um, discussed a lot in terms of, um, you know, improvement of, uh, you know, the capacity of, say, ministries of health, um, you know, rather than, um, you know, handing data sets or doing the work for them. Um, how do we actually build some of those networks? I know, Carolyn, you've done so much work in different places that has the touches on this. I mean, how, how would you, how would you think yeah. about this? So I think the COVID-19 crisis, but even before, it's very clear that there is an entire layer of people that's missing from the system right now. Um, that That is, that basically is, we need people that have technical expertise, not necessarily PhDs in computer science, but understand data, understand how it should be applied, but they are sitting and embedded within local context, context in government. At the moment, there's a, a kind of a void there. And part of the reason that we started uh, the COVID Mobility Data Network and Crisis Ready was because academics start to fill that gap um, because we develop methods that we think can be helpful and we can work with partners like Facebook. But longer term, for sustainability, for this to have to, to have real impact in the long term, there needs to be this layer of people that require training um, and needs and it needs long term investment and the recognition that you can't do this in a top down way, right? Like all of our interactions, I work with control programs for infectious diseases a lot, and there needs to be a fundamental shift from this idea that you can make a model of malaria in London and it's somehow going to be relevant for a control program worker on the ground in Uganda. You know, this is not, this is not the way we need to do it. And I think 
given everything that we were talking about and Jen's point that we need iterative, inter, you know, iterative communication between people that understand the data and understand the, the actual context and the needs, um, that has to be kind of bottom up. We need to build a network of people who are embedded in a local context who understand the problems and understand the biases and how the data could be used. So I think the, the big challenge for me looking at it is what the financing structure looks like for that. How do we globally and nationally start to invest in those people and give them the necessary training? We could come up with curricula, but how is that gonna be financed long-term? Right now there's kind of NGOs, management consultant firms, researchers, and it's all this kind of ad hoc environment. And I think we need to just, as a global community, we have to think much more systematically about how we finance and sustain that technical layer of people that can translate between worlds. Absolutely. No, this is a huge challenge. And I think your question around investment is, I think, one that's, um, you know, a lot of us are going to have to deal with. And, and I wanted to bring Sachit in to, did you want to um, respond to that as well, Sachit? <laughs> Just wanted to add to thank you, Andrew. I wanted to add to what Caroline said. If you look at the organograms in in departments of health and ministries of health and public health, um, especially in sort of the post-colonial world, right, which is a large um, percentage of of the global population, um, it hasn't changed much in the last um, 40, 50 years. Um, the one significant change was when computers arrived on the scene, and and you suddenly needed folks that. Uh, could could operate computers and and there was sort of budgeting done to allow for that shift and other than that there hasn't been sort of a significant new skill set injected into these ag agencies by and large um, around the world and I, I think you know there's growing recognition that that uh, some kind of data science capacity needs to be embedded. And as Caroline's rightly pointed out, there is high dependency on consulting companies. We've seen this across South Asia where ministries of health um, have interns working um, in their departments that have been essentially seconded from consulting companies, right? So it's not, it's not a great mismatch. You have a very young, smart people who um, you know, want to work in the public sector while employed by the private sector for a short period of time, but that's sort of no way to build sustainability. And, and, and so uh, there is a part of the translational work that I think we collectively need to think through is, is looking at uh, what the right paths of advocacy are uh, to these departments of health and public health, uh, including international aid agencies um, to free up the funds and resources to sustain this entire new cutter of, of uh, data scientists in, in one form or the other that we need in these uh, capacities. Definitely. I mean, we're almost at time, but just to note this issue around um, data science capacity, the role of consulting firms, the need to be able to create a new stratum of trained uh, people that are in ministries of health and ministries of environment and, and housing, et cetera, um, and, and, and how that fits in with power dynamics around data. Th this is another sort of key topic that I think we're going to have to take up um, again. Um, we're almost at time, but I just wanted to give Jen um, a chance to respond to some of this uh, to um, from from uh, you know sort of how you've been thinking about these issues about data literacy and uh, capacity and power. Sure. So you know, one additional note to Carolyn's comments. You know, what we've seen in the user feedback study with Northwestern and Crisis Ready is that the teams actually that were previously in uh, had co roles within government. So some of the researchers were actually positioned in, in the Canadian component of the CDC previous to COVID-19. The way that they were able to like adapt and move and fuse data and like and land it into meetings regularly, weekly, was much more advanced, at least in this very purposive sample of about 70 plus interviews. And we also saw some pretty interesting uh, similar phenomenons in Thailand with pre-existing relationships and sort of long-term relationships with people in public health offices to the point where people just knew that three, four, five visits were going to be required to have that conversation, which was essentially a component of data literacy. 
So we do have um, use cases or case examples of where these types of potential growth areas can be with the type of investment um, different structures and power and hierarchies are so willing to invest them. Um, I do you think that in sort of walking away from this really interesting conversation is the fact that these data sets and many more are so context driven when we move down the arc of information all the way to meaning and use. Um, so this one size fits all fallacy is actually interesting in that some of these data sets like you know the high resolution settlement leaders of population density they're they're huge, but once they sort of transform themselves to be purposeful, sometimes the questions that they need to answer for, for different organizations are rather simple. The process for which we get there is an issue of capacity, and that is a challenge. It is a challenge in our daily work with capacity. It's a challenge in our organizational leadership with regard to how do we build this for our organizations and our five-year strategic plans. So there's still a lot of um, uncertainty. Um, there's methodological uncertainty, both around the qualitative and the quantitative sides of the science. Um, but I think in the end, as I said in other sessions, you know, this work is people-driven, data-informed, but no matter what, I think if we strive to sort of um, accept and continue to work on inclusion um, all across all of this type of challenges and excesses that we have, we'll probably see hopefully some successes. And I think some of the examples that everybody has shared here, Justice and Aisha and, um, and Adam and everybody else's comments, I think is a testament to, um, to the, the positive things that can happen um, going forward as we address some of the pretty um, notable challenges. Thanks, Jen. Um, also, just to underline the point, um, you know, that both you and, and Carolyn made, um, you know, the, the COVID-19 mobility network was founded around providing s some of the stopgap expertise into governments, um, you know, at multiple levels from, from country down to municipal. Uh, you know, I think as we think about capacity in a sustainable way going forward, we're also going to have to continue to think through some of these stopgap measures and how do we make sure that they are contributing in the direction of long-term sustainable um, investment, even while we're filling gaps. Um, because we don't really have the luxury to not do it. And I think everyone that's spoken so far, you know, uh, from Kadasta, the UNICEF uh, team, um, to Alex and his work, um, you know, are, are all, I think, providing some of that, um, uh, of those measures um, and contributing in, in the directions that, that, we've been, that we've been going through. Um, so, I would, I'd like encourage everyone to get in touch with us. You can email at info at crisisready.org. You can connect over LinkedIn. I'd, I'd like to extend a thanks to everyone that spoke today. Um, uh, you're all doing amazing work. Uh, all of you are featured in the report uh, that is out. And I'd really like to extend a special thank you to, to Laura um, and the team at Facebook um, for, I, I really think, doing extraordinary work to, uh, you know, make data resources available to the community, um, to, to think along with the community as we kind of work through these issues. Um, um, and hopefully, you know, these uh, conversations are helpful to your um, and your team's thinking as we go forward. Um, and, and it's, it's just, uh, it, it's a, it's a, it's a pleasure to work with you. So, um, the gratitude is, uh, is very, it's deeply mutual. So I, we feel the same way about our partners. Thank you all so much for your hard work. It's been, it's been quite a year. <laughs> it's been quite a January so far, by the way. So um, <laughs> hopefully, uh, hopefully things are on the upswing. But um, all right, thank you everyone. Um, the recording will be available um, 